Thank you, Daniel, and uh, have some good singing this morning, and always encouraged by the gifts the Lord uses. Yeah, I'm on it. Yes, sir. And uh, and you guys are also in for a treat. I, I don't know if it was um, accidental or what. I don't really believe in accidents, but I got to hear some uh, Christmas um, preview uh, playing with the little kiddos this morning. So that was really cute. And uh, so you guys are in for a treat. Listen, as Daniel had mentioned, my name's Alex Gonzalez. Um, last name ends in an S and I do not speak Spanish. So don't, don't try that. All right. And uh, I was born in South Texas, uh, grew up in, in Plano. So, um, and anyhow, that just gives you a little bit about me. And as Daniel mentioned, my wife, Tabitha, um, and we've got two amazing kids, Cody, who should be graduating from the University of North Texas this winter, this spring, something like that. He's doing some student teaching right now um, at his high school alma mater, Frisco Heritage, doing some football coaching as well. So we're really excited and proud of him. My daughter, Avery, who is 15, uh, she's um, she's a stick of dynamite. She's a, she's a firecracker, if you will, and she's an avid good softball player so uh, anyway so really grateful um, and I have two chihuahuas and it's not because my last name's Gonzalez but I just have two chihuahuas and my wife wanted small dogs I'm a boxer kind of guy so if that gives you any glimpse of who I am well, listen, uh, just uh, to tell you uh, who I am and what I do, I do bring greetings on behalf of Dr. Nathan Lorig and the 2,700 churches that consist of what we call a network of churches, the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. Now, I, I don't take it um, for granted that not everybody knows what Southern Baptists do, specifically the SBTC, the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. So in case you're wondering, um, so we started about 25 years ago with 120 churches, 120 churches, just like Trinity came together, pastors, laymen, laywomen came together and said, we want to start a new state convention um, for theological reasons and financial reasons. And, and they came together 25 years ago and um, we've grown to 2,700 churches. Churches where churches um, autonomously, right? So Southern Baptist, not not assuming what your background is in your church life, your denominational life, but Southern Baptist um, guys like me exercise zero authority over the church. Zero authority over the church. It's it's the autonomy of the local church led by the Holy Spirit, King Jesus. He is the head of the church. And now doesn't mean we can't bring consulting, but that looks like whether it's consulting or encouraging or maybe training through children's ministry, a special needs ministry, um, and all in between. Uh, student camps and things like that, church planting. Um, if, if you faithfully and if you are part of the SBTC, you support a hundred new works throughout the state. But also um, things like I do, uh, church health and leadership, where we come in and help churches in transition, whatever that looks like, whether it's pulpit supply, interim pastor, um, finding a new pastor, whatever the conversation is for the church, as little or as much we are willing to help. Um, but, but pastoral care as well. Right. Pastoral care, um, which is something near and dear to my heart. And then um, probably the most well known of them all would be the international missionaries. Right. Southern Baptists have come together through all of this, what we call the cooperative program. Um, how many of you were raised in the Southern Baptist Church and have heard cooperative program before? Okay, that's like a third of you. So that means a two-thirds of you aren't familiar. So for over 100 years, Southern Baptists have, have, have really created this, probably the greatest giving mechanism in all of Christendom. 
and where they pull their resources together and, and, and spread it nationally and internationally to support missionaries all across this great world. But maybe disaster relief. Maybe you're familiar with disaster relief. Men and women in the yellow hat that they go when there's fires, tornadoes, floodings, hurricanes. We got crews right now in Florida. The last count that I saw was 135, 140 deaths, largest in nearly 100 years in Florida. Things like that. But I say all that to say thank you. Thank you, because what you do, I get to go around and help churches, minister to churches. And it, it's kind of tough sometimes because I am away from my family often. So that can be a little bit of a challenge. But nonetheless, we're doing the, God, doing the Lord's work. Speaking of the Lord's work, if you have your copy of God's Word, let me invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 3. The book of Philippians chapter 3. And... I have titled this morning's sermon, discussion, lesson, however you want to tag it, Kingdom-Centered Discipleship. Kingdom-Centered <clears throat> Discipleship. We'll be in verses 12 of chapter 3 through verse 1 of chapter 4. And that doesn't make much sense. I'll explain in just a moment. <clears throat> but let me ask you this. What comes... To mind, Trinity. What comes to mind when you hear the word discipleship? Maybe, let me ask it this way. What verses come to mind? Is it Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, to go and make disciples of Farmersville? Only. No. Of all nations, right? Probably a less popular verse is Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Whoever wants to be my disciple must first elevate himself. No, must first deny himself. That word disciple in the Greek literally, um, mathetes, you can hear it in there. We get the word mathematics from that word. It's a learner, a pupil, right? Being a student. And over 200 times that passage, excuse me, that word disciple is used in all of Scripture. Now... One more piece of important background, if you will, just to give you some context as we look at this passage. I don't know when the last time you studied, read, or even heard a sermon through the book of Philippians. It's a pretty popular book, right? It's a short book. You can read it in less than 15 minutes. So whatever your favorite sitcom is, right, you can read it in half that time. You can read it in the, the halftime of the Dallas Cowboys game um, or maybe even more. More. So, I don't know, they're doing pretty good with Cooper Rush right now, so we'll see how that goes. But, um, but the background is important, and if you listen attentively just for a moment, you'll understand why. So, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ happened somewhere in the early 30s ADs, okay? So, depending on archaeologists and depending on scholars, right, theologians, they'll tell you roughly 30 to 33 AD. That's when Christ died, he was buried, he rose again, and he ascended to the right hand of the Father. We, we know this in the gospel stories, the gospel accounts. Paul's radical conversion in Acts chapter 9, we see that he came to faith radically. He didn't walk an aisle. He didn't say a prayer. The Lord uh, uh, intercepted Saul's mission. You say he was on a mission to persecute Christians. For 2,000 years, believers have been persecuted for their faith. And I appreciate, is it Revel? Let's say that right. I appreciate her prayer because the comfort that we've come to know in American Christendom is, is nothing like some of what our brothers and sisters are facing in second and third world countries. But this was the Apostle Paul's conversion, right? Saul, he was, he was uh, an elite Pharisee. Top of his game was sent on a mission to hunt down Christians. And the Lord radically 
intervene. Let, let me say it like this, because I, I think this makes sense, especially in the last 20 years of our culture. Um, it's fair to say that the Apostle Paul, and this is why we see the hesitation of the early disciples when they're instructed to encounter or to, to minister to now Paul, who was Saul, because he was in essence a first century terrorist. Coming to faith in Christ. It's all right there. It's in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, you can get the backstory of the book of Philippians in Acts chapter 15 and 16. You've heard of the Philippian jailer, haven't you? This is the backstory. Well, let me let me go on. So what we find ourselves here in Philippians or Acts 15 and 16, right, is Paul's second missionary journey around 50 AD. So some 16 years after Paul meets the Lord radically, right? By the way, Paul didn't get a choice. He didn't have a choice in the matter. He came to faith because the Lord said it so. This was a second missionary journey. He's in Europe, right? The church at Philippi. This would have been the first church planted on European soil. This is very, very important. 50 AD or so, right? This would be modern day Greece if you've traveled there. Their charter members would have been Lydia, the dealer in Fine purple linen. You, you know the story, right? What about the second charter member, the Philippian jailer? Right? When all else, uh, when all the other inmates escaped, Paul and Silas stayed put, and, and that boldness led the jailer speechless, coming to faith in Christ, his whole family. But what we don't talk about is the, the reason they were thrown into jail. We see this in Acts 15, 16. We see this demon-possessed girl, this demoniac, right, that, that was following around Paul and Silas. If you read the Scripture, it seems like she was preaching with them, but no, she was mocking them. And, and the Scripture says Paul became greatly annoyed. He turns around, cast out the demon, and then that demon-possessed girl was now not making money for her owner. So the owner had Paul and Silas beaten, thrown into prison, 50 A.D. or so. And then fast forward to 62 A.D. Paul is imprisoned again, but not in Philippi, in Rome, under the leadership of Nero. A cruel man, a, a violent man. And just do the backstory. He, he, he would have written this letter, most scholars tell us, in 62 AD. So, so why am I saying this? So a decade plus has passed from when, when Paul started this church. But yet he writes a letter to the church at Philippi some 12 years later. What does this speak to? It speaks to the intimacy, the relationship, the love and care that the church at Philippi had with the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Paul had with the church at Philippi. Just imagine, just imagine a, a pastor of 10, 20, maybe 30 years ago, as I met with some of the men several Wednesdays ago, asking how long they've been here, asking what they do. Think about those pastors of decades past writing a letter to Trinity. <laughs> what would you do? Or maybe it speaks to the relationship we have between pastor and parishioner, and parishioner and pastor. I've got a whole other sermon on that found in Philippians 2. But here we go. Philippians 3, what I'm going to do for time's sake, and I am watching the time. I want to be sensitive to that. I want to speak to you about kingdom-centered discipleship. Centered discipleship. Chapter 3, verses 12 through 4, 1. You say, why end in verse 1 of chapter 4? Well, keep in mind, church, that about 500 years ago or so, there were no such things as chapters and verses in Holy Scripture. You're like, oh, what? Like, no, it wasn't. Just go and just do a little bit of research, you'll find. So, so what it was is just like if you were to write an email or a letter 
to somebody the same way you would do that, Paul is writing this letter to the church at Philippi. It's got an intro, it's got a body, it's got a conclusion. Typically with the Apostle Paul, he has an argument, he has a charge, and what he does here for us, I'm going to give you three words, three phrases rather. They're not on, they're not on the screen, but I'm going to break them up like this just for time's sake. Those three phrases are this. When you think about kingdom-centered discipleship, I want you to think about three things. Number one is to keep pressing. Keep pressing. Number two is to keep imitating. And then number three is to keep standing. Do you have those three phrases? So whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is you're dealing with right now, may, may, we, may we align that and center that and, and, and might we have whatever it is we're struggling with, whether it's a relationship, finances, it's a job, maybe it's church life. I don't know why we're always surprised when, when, I mean, just like in our home life, just like on the job, just like in school, we have challenges. We have relational um, conflicts. But yet, when that spills over into the church, we're always surprised. I'm never surprised. I'm not surprised, nor should I think you be surprised. But whatever it is you're dealing with, maybe you're dealing with your salvation this morning. Maybe the Lord's working in your heart and your mind and your soul this morning. Maybe it's church membership. Maybe it's church service. Whatever it is this morning. Maybe you have an idol in your life. Maybe, like many today, you're angry, you're frustrated, and you just want to give up. Keep pressing. Keep imitating. Keep standing. Here, here. Let me, let me just break it down. I'm going to do 12 through 16. That's the first section. That's to keep pressing. So pressing. Read that with me. Not that I have already attained. So we're right in the middle of this letter. And, and one of the greatest disciples of Jesus, right? says this, not that I have already attained, I'm already perfected, but I press on, right? Keep pressing. <laughs> that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, arrested, to grab hold, but one thing I do, Trinity, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to the things which are ahead. Watch this. The second time I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, verse 15, let us, as many are as mature, as are mature, implying some are not mature, right? Spiritually speaking. Look what he says. Have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, so what level we've already attained in our spiritual journey, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Number one is to keep pressing. Three things quickly under this. Keep pressing in self-awareness. He says it in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained this. Self-awareness is, is sorely lacking in society today. Right? And this is something that I work really hard on is, is knowing when I'm, 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 I'm giving life to a room or knowing when I'm sucking the air right out of the room. Some of you are thinking about somebody else right now. No, no. The idea is to think about you, right? Like self-awareness. Not others' awareness, but self-awareness. Like, like and, and, and by the way, and it helps having my wife and my 15-year-old daughter. They're, they're really good at pointing out my, my shortcomings. They're like, hey, you, you're struggling here, Alex. You're struggling there, right? I get it. And we joke about it, but... And sometimes it's good to laugh, but, but having self-awareness, let me say it like this, humility. The Apostle Paul, when he had no reason to have humility, he had humility. Number two is a stick to that verse 13 and, and 14, right? It's a head-down mindset. It's a head-down spirit. Number three, verses 15 and 16, is sanctification, right? Let us who are mature have this mind. 
And if anybody thinks otherwise, God will reveal this to them. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. So this is holiness, right? This is constantly maturing, constantly growing. It's not about perfection. It's about progression. So, kingdom-centered discipleship is found in the spirit and the posture of keep pressing. Number two is to keep imitating. To keep imitating. Look at verse 17 through 21 with me. <clears throat> Brethren, or brothers, sisters, right? He's speaking to the whole body. Join in following my example. Don't miss this. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping. A decade later, he's still weeping for those who just don't get it. That they are the enemies of the cross. Now they're enemies? That's kind of harsh, Paul. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he is saying you're either for him or against him. Verse 19, whose end is in is destruction, whose God is their belly. Now why is he meddling now? Whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Don't miss this, verse 20, right? For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Number two, keep imitating. Well, twofold, twofold. Just a couple more minutes. Hang in there with me. Who are we to keep imitating? Well, he says in verses 17 through 19, follow me. Follow me, right? So Christ followers. You say, wait a minute, you've got it backwards. Well, that's just the order of this passage because he is, he is saying, yes, follow my example. He's saying, yes, follow his or her example. Let me, let me just pause there for a second and ask you, is there somebody in, your, in, your, in the history of your life, in the history of your faith, whether it's a Sunday school teacher, a VBS leader, maybe a pastor, a, a, a deacon, maybe a sweet, precious widow, Somebody that you can think on right now that was instrumental in you not only coming to faith, but you staying in the faith. Who is that man? Who is that woman? Who is that person? Maybe it's a church. Maybe, maybe all you have in your head is an image of a church. Maybe, maybe it's that. Maybe, maybe there are some uh, images and some thoughts and some memories you wish to erase all together. I submit to you that, that, listen, in those most difficult times, in the challenging times, that's really what makes us who we are. It's not the easy. It's not the smooth. It's the difficult. If you have any athletic background, if you have any military background, you know what I'm speaking of. That's really this. Christ followers. Paul says, follow me. Note those who follow appropriately. Note those who do not. It's a really stark distinction here. It's a distinction here that Paul is mentioning when it comes to imitating. <clears throat> Before I go on, let me just ask you this. Who are you pouring into this morning, right now? Who are you speaking to about the Lord Jesus? Who are you teaching about His Word and His will and His ways? Who are you ministering to you? To Who are you discipling, kingdom-centered discipleship? This could be... Alex's biggest problem right here. Right? Yeah, I, I want to follow, but I'm not sure I want to lead. Right? I want to follow somebody who seems to have it all together, although I know they don't. Just not quite ready to lead. I just don't know if I have the certain giftedness, the certain qualities. Look, 
If you, if you spend any time with me, you'll realize the Lord has a sense of humor. Right? Not because I'm funny. I don't have a sense of humor. Right? I, I, I try to be funny, but again, my wife, my daughter, they remind me how funny I'm not. Right? And like when I met with the men a few weeks ago, I was like, look, and, and, and I think it was there. Maybe it was BJ and Daniel. I don't, I don't know. I try to do this often, but... Um, since I've been on medication, gabapentin, I don't have seizures, but I, but I take gabapentin for Tourette's. I, maybe you're familiar with Tourette's syndrome. I, I don't know. It's also linked to obsessive compulsive disorder, a really mild case. And I'm, I'm grateful I don't yell curse words or racial slurs like the movie. Um, but, I, but I have it. And you're thinking, what in, I mean, how is this even? Listen, it doesn't matter. All throughout Scripture, from Genesis to the max, as the old preacher said. From Genesis, in between, and at the very end, God uses men and women who most people would not categorize as someone that would meet their standards. But then in verses 20 and 21, he says, imitate not only Christ followers, but imitate Christ himself. He says it right there, 20 and 21. And listen, I get, I get being a citizen of Farmersville, of Texas, of this great nation. But if that's where your hope lies, we're missing, we're missing it all. He says, your citizenship is in heaven. If you are a true believer, a born again, baptized believer, not just Southern Baptists, Mainline evangelists, those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your citizenship is in heaven. And you're to eagerly wait such. First Chronicles 16.11, seek the Lord. Seek His face. Seek His strength. And, and I'm not going to elaborate on it, but just one page over to your left, Philippians 2. Speaking of Christ Himself... <clears throat> This was mentioned in a conversation I had this morning. This kind lady brought up one of my favorite passages in, in, in all of Philippians 2, but specifically 5 through 11. This, this little section of Scripture is, is tagged throughout church history. The Christ Hymn. Because of the Christological significance of, of the Christ that is packed into these few verses... Speaking of following his example, speaking of himself, speaking of humility. Let me read this just quickly. It's, it's really stunning when you stop to think. In verses 1 through 4, right, he speaks to our humility, right? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Watch this. I'm, con I'm convinced half the world's problems right now, especially on the Texas highways. When I leave here, I'm going to Teague, Texas. And the older I get, the less I want to drive at night. I'm becoming my parents. And the, the less I want to, like, be on the Texas highways. I was born and raised here. But we're clueless when it comes to driving. I'm telling you, people are angry. People are scared. In Dallas, I pastored for 10 years in East Dallas. People are shooting each other. Because they cut them off. Actually, people losing their lives. Let nothing be done from selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also the interest of others. Cooperative efforts. And then 5 through 11, this is, this is Christ himself. Look at verses 5 through 11, Philippians 2. Quickly here. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. When Alex is desiring to have a reputation, when so many of us are, are, are elevating ourselves, Christ made himself of no reputation. This is kingdom-centered submission, kingdom-centered discipleship. He goes on, taking the form of a bondservant, a slave, and coming in the likeness of men, right? Jesus, God, man, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. 
in chapter 1, he says, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. That is opposite of what I know and understand being a Texan is. I'm not a pacifist by any stretch of the imagination. But, but in spirit and in posture, right? I'm not suggesting that if somebody's going to come in here and attack me and start beating on me or you, I, I would intervene. Just so you know, I'm not a pacifist, okay? But in, but in posture, when it comes to opinions, when it comes to ideas, when it comes to service, submit. Keep pressing, keep imitating. Finally, chapter 4, verse 1. Keep standing. Keep standing. <clears throat> I'm going to read verse 1 and give you three things quickly, and we'll be done. Therefore, my beloved... And long for, brethren, my joy and crown. So stand fast, hence the keep standing, in the Lord, beloved. Three things we see right here. Paul can keep standing. You can keep standing because of his love. Paul wasn't willing to give up on them. Because of the love of the Lord for him and his love for the Lord. He had no choice. In the matter. He had, some of you have been running from the Father far too long. Some of you are convinced you've outsmarted Him. I know, because I came to faith at 14, and I didn't start living for the Lord until I was 27, 13 years, if my math's right. Answered a late call to ministry. And for 13 years, I thought I had Him beat. Love. Also, longing, right? He longed for them. Paul longed for the church at Philippi. They, they helped support him, not only mentally, emotionally, spiritually, but, but financially, which ultimately was physically sustenance for him, physical sustenance. He longed for them. Later on, he says, I hope to see you, but I'm going to send back Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was the one who made the trip from Philippi to see him in Rome. By the way, I didn't mention this earlier, but that's somewhere between 800 and 1,000 miles apart. And, and just to, to make sure I was on point, I went to Google last night and I, and I did the, the mapping. They suggest you fly, which is an eight-hour flight. But if you were to, to walk it, the shorter route, taking a boat, crossing uh, um, the, 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 this one little section of sea there, right? It would still take you 220 hours at minimum. So look, I did the math and I wrote it down, just jotted it down. If you're slow and walking 20 miles a day at seven hours a day, it would take you 44 days nonstop. If your average, five hours a day, 20 miles a day, still 45, 44 miles, excuse me, 44 days. And if you're fast, like I want to be, three hours, 20 miles, 44 days. In reality, this was more like a three, four, five month journey for Epaphroditus. And he longed for them. Paul longed for them. And then finally, that last phrase there. So stand fast in the Lord. You can keep standing because of love, longing, and the Lord. Not sure what you're dealing with this morning. Maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you can honestly say, I've never given my life to Christ. I go to church. I'm a good person, Alex. I give a little money. But I've never surrendered completely my life to Him. He is not Lord of my life. If you can honestly say that this morning, then why not you do business with Him? Maybe He's dealing with you right now. Maybe you're here and you are a believer, but you've never been baptized in the faith. Immersed, baptized, though. Underwater. Right? Maybe you're a, a born again, baptized believer, but you've never you've never given church membership a consideration. 
Maybe that's it. Fourthly, maybe you just need prayer. I'm going to be down in front and um, maybe an invitation, a response song. Uh, do we have that on the docket? So we can invite the team up for that and for an invitation, for a time to respond, nothing formal. My microphone will be off. I'll be down in front. I'm going to ask you to stand with heads bowed and, and eyes closed as we transition to a time of response, a time of invitation. However the Lord's dealing with you. We won't be long, just a minute or two, but let me encourage you. Won't you come?